Right, well, let's get this underway this afternoon. Um, my name is John Richardson. I'm one of the trustees. Uh, I spent 30 years of, 35 years of my life working with the EU institutions. So the good news is that I know more in general about EU funding probably than anybody else in this room. And the bad news is most of you probably know more about funding sale training than I do. So my job is to facilitate uh, this session um, this afternoon. And I'll introduce the, the two speakers in just a moment. Um, the funding under the Erasmus Plus program, which is the one we normally concentrate on, and, and it's the one I will concentrate on because it's the best bet for funding. Uh, the, the funding is administered by the Director General for Education and Culture. So you can go onto its website in the European Commission and, and you can look up EAC or Director General Education and Culture and you will in theory find out that that's in charge of this program. Well, yes and no. No because they don't administer it at all. They're in charge of drawing up the draft regulations and having those approved by the Council and the Parliament but the actual administration of a program is done by individual member states, and that's what we're going to get onto, and that is a big problem. For all the knowledge I have about the central EU institutions, it doesn't help us at all to get the funding for, for your individual program. So that's, that's the situation, unfortunately. There is a total of nearly 15 billion euros available over the next seven years for the Erasmus Plus program. Sounds like a lot of money, doesn't it? But it's really there to organize any activity in the fields of education, training, youth or sport throughout 27 member states. So, and you can imagine that there are an awful lot of organizations, particularly an awful lot of organizations like you, NGOs doing extremely good work, who are all competing with each other for this money. So uh, it's not as much as all that. One of the interesting things to find out today, if we can, is which are the member states which turn out in practice to be particularly interested in sale training and therefore where we are most likely to be able to, to get some money. Erasmus Plus projects must be submitted by so-called participating organizations. These represent the participants in the programs. They can't be presented by trainees themselves, individual participants. It has to be an organization which applies to, uh, to get a grant from the Erasmus Plus program. And as I've said, the program is implemented by national agencies. Um, this is one of those awful slides which you have to read slowly and carefully. So. That's what we're going to do. The, what they do is they provide information on the Erasmus Plus program. So you're probably better getting information on the program directly from your national agency than trying to go onto the central website of the EU. Secondly, they're supposed to administer a fair and transparent selection process for project applications. My own feeling is and my own experience is that what fair and transparent selection means varies from one member state to another and you need to know the culture of your own member state if you're planning to put in an application here and know how it how it um, interprets these these criteria in the uk we think we do things in a totally fair manner and everybody else does things in an unfair manner in scandinavia the typical um, received wisdom is that every government decision in Scandinavia is totally transparent. This is not even believed in Italy, never mind applied. So there are variations, and you need to find out what these words actually mean. All these words come from the central website. The national agency also monitors and evaluates the implementation of a program in their country. Now that means additional administrative work for all of you on a, on a project. And you need to find out how onerous that will be, how difficult it will be, how much time and, and resources it will take you. They're supposed to provide support to project applicants and participating organizations during the project. 
that also varies from one member state national agency to another. Some are more helpful than others. So it's a very good idea to find others who've got projects through your own national agency and talk to them about their experience before you uh, go ahead with applications. And they're supposed to collaborate effectively with the network of all national agencies and the European Commission, which means they get to go on nice trips to Brussels every year and, um, and get to know the Brussels restaurants as well as you all are getting to know the A Coruña restaurants. They're supposed to ensure the visibility of a program. Again, that varies also from, from one member state to another. And they're supposed to promote the dissemination and exploitation of the results of a program. Now, that's interesting if you think about it, because one of the things we're trying to do is to gather data about the results of our programs and, and the benefits from them. So it's really worth uh, exploring whether your national agency will actually help to gather that and uh, collate that data at the end of it. The first key action which can be, uh, can be funded is mobility of individuals. Mobility doesn't mean financing a marathon. It means taking young people from one country to another. That's what the meaning of mobility is here. So what, this, what uh, projects under this action do is they promote transnational mobility activities. And they target learners and staff. In other words, projects can be about trainees. They can also be about trainers. And that's something which I think has been insufficiently explored. If any of you have experience of getting EU funds to help uh, your trainers to learn by going to a different member state, and learning best practice, and please let us know, because that's something I think which we need to explore together. This is a statement of the aims of a program. Um, this is the, the Erasmus Plus program, what it's supposed to teach. You could just put sail training over it, couldn't you, at the top? It's to support learners in the acquisition of competences, knowledge, skills, and attitudes with a view to improving their personal development and, and employability. Isn't that exactly how we describe what sale training is? So in principle, sale training should be the ideal type of activity to be financed under this program, particularly because it's also supposed to raise participants' awareness and understanding of other cultures and countries. Now, one of the things I'd like to look at and, and, and we'd welcome your views on is, can we develop a, whoops, a common description of what we do which expands on that? My suspicion is we need something like a page which takes that short sentence and expands it to say exactly how sale training hits all these targets. And that's something which we could all use in translation in projects throughout the, uh, the European Union if we can develop a common description. So it should be possible for groups of NSTOs with other partners to design programs which could place trainees on ships. And I believe the appropriate period, according to the website, is 21 days. We may hear something different from Michael, I suspect, but we'll, but we'll have a look at that. You need to check that, how long the project uh, can be. Is it two weeks or is it, or is it three weeks? I suspect this might uh, change from one member state to another and of appropriate curricula. Now there's a vague phrase. This is typical European Union phraseology. Appropriate curricula have to be in front. Well, of course they do, but what does that mean? And that's something where there is room, it seems to me, for the learning which we do with each other in this sort of conference. What is an appropriate curriculum? What is an appropriate sale training program? You all know that discussion, and the more convincing we can be in in presenting the program we're going to give the trainees on the ships, the better. And then we should be able to exchange crew members with a view to their improving their skills through the exchange of best practice. Now that will not be 21 days, that will be much longer. And I think that's, that's something which, which we need to explore, as I've, as I've just said earlier, uh, said earlier. But there's another heading in the budget, which is European Voluntary Service. Now, if you think about it for a moment, so there are two different possibilities here. One is exchanging crews who are professional, and the other is exchanging crews who are volunteers. So it's possible we have two different um, opportunities here. For the youth exchanges, for the, for the trainees, 
Um, the duration of the activity is between 5 and 21 days, it says on our website. Eligible participants are between 13 and 30, N not a problem for us. Number of participants must be a minimum 16 and maximum 60. And we're going to hear from, from Michael, I think, that his typical project has fewer than 60 participants. One of the things you have to think about is, how much work do I have to do to get this, this project approved and get the money? And there are others I've talked to who say, you need to go for the maximum because you'll have the same paperwork for 20 as you will for 60. And I'll be interested to see what Michael has to, has to say about that. But it seems to me you're better to go for 60 participants, uh, participants than for 16. Eligible participating organizations can be non-profit organizations, of course. Uh, you have to apply to the agency in the country where you're based. So if you have, if you're a German, if you have a German NSTO and you want to do a program of exchange with uh, trainees from, from Poland, you don't apply in Warsaw, you apply in Berlin. So that's what you need to know. You need to apply in your own home uh, country with the appropriate agency. Uh, but the activity must involve at least two participating organizations from different countries. One of the things we'll be talking about is how many partners do you actually need? Because for a good project, you need a partner who will um, either provide or find the trainees. You need a partner who will match trainees and ships. You need a partner who will, who will um, produce the sail training program. You can, you can imagine multiple ways of doing this involving agencies from different countries. One of the questions I have is, and this is, this is for Michael and for Monique, have you got a better chance if you have partners from five different countries or if you have them from only two different countries? Uh, that sort of question, I think, is a very practical question to which we need to find uh, the appropriate answer, which may differ from one member state to another. The deadlines, in principle, um, you can see them here. 17th of March, you must put the project in for a project starting between 17th of June and 31st of December of the same year. Problem with this is you don't have much time. In particular, because you're not going to know on the 17th of March whether you've got the project or not. And similarly, 30th of April for projects starting between August of the same year and 28th of February of the following year. None of this, if you look at it, is really terribly helpful for sale training. So we'll see what experience uh, we have had with that. And then as a European Voluntary Service, and this is where, here we are, this is, what are we t this is where we're talking about basically volu a volunteer cruise. Of course, you get a lot more money for someone to spend 12 months in another member state than you do for someone to spend three weeks in another member state. So it seems to me that this may well be something that we should be looking at. And you could imagine several national sail training organizations or several ships from different countries getting together to jointly present a project here to exchange their volunteer crews and to be paid to do so, which is, which is a question of income then coming in for the ships. So can we use this for crew exchange and financing? That's the question we're looking at here. Um, Nothing new really on the criteria for this. It's exactly similar to the criteria for the exchange of trainees. The four steps, you register in the participant portal, which you'll find on, on the website of the, of the agency. You check the compliance with the program criteria. Well, I mean, that's what we've just been explaining. You check the financial conditions. You have to be aware that each project is only going to be able to ask for a grant from one EU budget and not from multiple budgets. And you have to fill in and submit the application form. Sounds easy. EU application forms are famously complex. And finally, your national agencies. You might like to take out a pen and a piece of paper and write that down. If you don't have a pen or a piece of paper, I do have the list of all the agencies with me, printed out, and you can come and, come and look it up uh, from me afterwards and get the address and the website and the email of your national agency. I've got it with me, but I don't have 30 copies. I have one, okay? So feel free to come up and see me afterwards. 
Right, so now let's move on to our first speaker, Michael Byrne, um, who's from Sail Training Ireland. Sail Training Ireland was formed in 2011, but it's not the beginning of sail training in Ireland because, because one of its aims was to keep the spirit of sail training alive after the loss of, of Asgard in 2008. Uh, Michael is an outdoor adventure professional and a sailing instructor. It says in my biography here, he undertook the role of manager in 2011 and since then Sail Training Ireland has progressed from a part-time organisation to a full-time registered charity. Just take a moment to think what that means. He's been hugely successful up till now. So he's done a great, a, a great deal of good for Sail Training in Ireland. And he's been successful at securing EU Commission youth funding. And he's done that, I think, for five complete programs involving over 100 trainees. And he's now going to tell us how he did it and, how, uh, uh, and what his experience is of working with the, uh, with the national agency. And I'm pretty sure he'll use the opportunity to do some advertising as well for his organization. How you doing? I wasn't sure where you had gotten the biography, so I didn't know what was going to come out there, John. Yeah. Um, as John said, I'm from Sail Training Ireland. Um, we were founded in 2011. Um, I'm just going to talk you through really how we have accessed this funding and how we had, have used it to achieve our aims as an organisation. Um, we our, our mission is to create voyage opportunities for young people. That's what ev everything we were involved in is, is, is under that core aim, and we always refer back to that uh, objective. When I started in 2011, uh, we had a few challenges. We had no ships, we had no money, and we had no trainees. So we were really starting from scratch. Um, I discovered this funding um, through a connection I have at home, um, and they suggested I, I could do an, uh, an application for a youth exchange. Um, as John has explained, the youth exchange involves having at least two groups of people from two, at least two different countries, bringing them together for an educational program. So this gives you an idea of the, um, uh, the numbers that we've achieved to date. 2012, we did our first project with 28 trainees for eight days. Uh, 2013, we did uh, voyage on Golden Lou for 44 trainees over 10 days. 2014, as you can see, we've increased, so we were able to run two youth exchanges. There's another bracket of, of a project called the Youth Initiative, which is a smaller version. Uh, you can do them, they're transnational projects, so you can have two, two countries and you get a once-off grant. I think it has changed under the new scheme, but I think it's about uh, last year it was 7,100. So that's more applicable to a smaller vessel. Um, seven yeah. It doesn't exist anymore, but it's not only one program. Is there not transnational youth initiatives? I don't think so. It's, it's all within an open Yeah, th this was under, the, well, th there's, a, there's a number of, of uh, there used to be a number of models of projects that we were able to apply for the funding for. So last year we did, um, we did a number of youth exchanges. Um, we did a youth initiative. We then also um, worked with the Pelican of London, which is a vessel from the UK, and they applied for um, a youth exchange fund with us as a partner, and we recruited half of the trainees for that. So we, we, we funded trainees through that means as well. And we assisted in, in providing some information towards the application. Um, so, uh, sorry, just the, the last thing there is that we trained up our leaders. So we involved leaders in this, these projects to implement the program, and we trained them up in advance. Um, total results today, as you can see, we've had nearly 200 trainees, nearly 2,000 days at sea. Um, one, of, one of the main things for us as an enabling goal for our organization is to get ships into Dublin because obviously we don't have any ships in, in Ireland. So we use these projects to, to bring ships into the area. Um, in 2015, I've put an application in recently for um, two voyages. We're going to uh, hopefully run those voyages on Morganster over uh, four weeks, so there'll be two weeks each. Um, and, and this is probably one of the factors, John, um, 
in terms of the numbers, the, the ships available to us can carry a certain amount of trainees. So you have to build your project around what, what resources you have. Um, your project has to take place with the whole group together. Now, you could potentially do a project with a number of ships side by side, but to date, we've just done one project on one ship at a time. So you're limited by the number of trainees on, on that ship. Um, we've also this year put in, we've put, the application we've put in has three projects in, in one application, which is a nice development in the application process in the new scheme. You, we put in two youth exchanges and one youth leader mobility, which uh, will give us some funding to uh, run a three-day program where we train our leaders up. Um, so uh, when you're applying for your project, you have to design an educational program. You're not, you're, you're not applying for funding for a tall ship voyage. You're applying for funding for a, a youth exchange educational program. And uh, there are various themes of education that uh, you will design your, pro your program around. Um, and under, the, under one of those main themes, you will then have a number of educational aims. Um, uh, so in 2015, employability is where we're focusing. And the reason we're focusing on employability as a, as a core aim is because uh, I've done a lot of speaking to sponsors in recent times. And a lot of the corporate social responsibility objectives at this time coming out of recession are, in, are getting people back to employment. So we have built that into our projects. And then we'll seek outside sponsorship to, to try and come up with an extra budget around them. <coughs> so um, you design your educational aims and objectives under which there are, there are various learning aims. And then you have to design a daily program of workshops and activities that take place on board your voyage that achieve those educational aims. And your leaders need to be able to implement that program. So um, the, the leaders are a very important part of all of this. <clears throat> so these are some of the uh, learning aims. I think Monique is going to talk quite a bit more about that side of it, so I won't go into too much detail. But these are some of the um, learning aims that we've built into our programs. As you can see there, sailing and seamanship skills can certainly be part of it, but it's not, it, it's not the overall uh, project. Um, so our daily program involves workshops, activities, talks, um, tools like this, the various leadership styles, or the Johari window, which explores self-awareness, would be some of the tools that we use to um, run activities and workshops on board. One of the most important things I would say is in our first project, we tried to do a tall ship voyage and then do um, a program of activities on board, which was almost separate to the, to the tall ship activities um, to achieve the educational aims. And that became quite difficult to work. So what we do now is we try and harness the activities of tall ship sailing, of sail training, and use them as activities to achieve our educational aims. So for example, uh, going aloft becomes a workshop in uh, building confidence with step-by-step -step process and, and a youth leader facilitating it. Now uh, we also have some outside speakers. We have a daily journal and um, the youth pass is, is, a, is a useful tool that is provided by the scheme where the young people involved set their own learning aims. They assess their own achievement of those learning aims and they award themselves a certificate. So it's self-assessed learning and it really involves the participants in, in, the, um, in setting their own goals. Um, our youth leaders, uh, what we do is we, um, we re recruit, a, uh, last year we had six, this year we're going to have 12. We're going to go to the outdoor education uh, third level programs to, to get them this year because we need people with a specific set of skills. People coming from a youth work background is great as well. Uh, it's, it's important to get a variety of skills to get male and female in, involved as well. Um, sailing is valuable, sailing skills, but not all of your leaders are necessarily uh, experienced sailors. Um, so, and the important thing is that they're more than just watch leaders, they're actually youth leaders implementing the program. <clears throat> the trainee recruitment is an important part from our point of view. Um, we very much uh, have a, an objective of making sail training available to people from all backgrounds. So it's, it's not just people 
from disadvantaged background and it's not just people from from the the more uh, wealthy backgrounds or the, the the yacht clubs and, and that kind of thing so um, what we do is we go to youth and community groups across Dublin and across Ireland and those guys have their own groups of young people we don't actually have our own group of young people they nominate people who they feel are worthy of the experience or who need it and they also act as both a referee and they support the fundraising because they need to come up with a balance of three or four or five hundred euro and the youth organization take a lot of that workload off us and then we also end up with a repeat customer uh, so the youth organizations come back to us on an annual basis so it's a really good way to to go about recruiting your trainees um, so, uh, as I say, it enables us to access people that are most in need of the support, which is vital to us. Um, we then provide a briefing and an orientation. We coordinate some of the travel. We coordinate with the ships, the logistics. We would set the voyage passage. We design the program. We put it all together and, and, and we set it in motion. Uh, the, just to give you an idea of budget, um, in Ireland, uh, we apply through the national agency, which is Lergus. Each country has an allocated amount of funding. In Ireland, it's €39 Euro per night per person. So it would always be important to, get, to extend your voyage as long as possible. Um, we uh, tend to fit our voyages in between a couple of festivals so that the, that, that the ship uh, gets an appearance fee at those festivals. So that gives you an extra budget. But that, that will have a major influence on setting the length of our projects as well. Um, and, and we have done from up to 15 days long. Um, but they have varied in length. Uh, but the festivals are probably the main thing that, that influences us in that. <coughs> and of course the availability of ships, because ships have their own program that they set early in October, September. Um, and they will have destinations to get to. We work with the ships and we come up with a, a, a viable period of time that, that suits and we, we, we work it in, into that. Um, there's additional funding on top of the, the daily rate, which goes to travel to an advanced planning visit between the, um, the partners. And you can also apply for exceptional costs, whatever they may be. Um, the balance, and this is important, is fundraised through the, the nominating organizations. So uh, when they accept, uh, a position or two places on board our, our program, they also take responsibility to come up with the balance, which may, may be anywhere from three to five hundred euro, depending on on uh, the length of the voyage, <coughs> um, and obviously depending on what what deal we can arrange with with the ship, uh, what the overall cost is to the ship. We also have to incorporate some of our own exp our own operational costs into the into the budget, which we do, and then. Um, uh, that, that pays, pays our side of things as well. <coughs> there, an important part is that the participants are not expected to contribute directly. Our national agency applies the criteria very strictly. Uh, Monique will tell you that they're quite, they're very stringent in applying the rules, um, which makes it interesting. But uh, they will not allow participants to have to pay for their own way because that would exclude people who can't afford it. Um, so. That's why the, the nominating organizations set up and that partnership where the, the youth groups or the community groups or the schools are, are uh, coming up with a balance. Um, so, and, I mean, an example would be that on a 10 day voyage, trainees uh, would be fundraising up to 500 euro, uh, sometimes less. Um, so it's working out at somewhere between, last year I think our voyages were costing trainees 30 euro per day it'll probably be a little bit more this year, <coughs> but it's still quite good. Um, Sorry, Michael, can you, can you explain that a bit more? Yeah. You just said earlier that trainees don't have to raise any money, and they, now you seem to have said they have to raise 30 per day. So the nominating organizations have to take responsibility for that. Often the trainees are involved in fundraising that money themselves, but it's not expected to come directly from them that they wouldn't self-fund it. <clears throat> um, so our core objective as an organization is to create opportunities for voyages, but obviously there's a lot of enabling um, activities that we're involved in to achieve those. And these uh, youth exchange projects have helped us to achieve those aims. One of the main ones is that Dublin City Council and Dublin Port are one of our main supporters. 
And as part of our arrangement with them, we have to achieve a number of objectives, try and get more ships into Dublin, try and generate more activity on the River Liffey, try and generate more social benefits to the local communities. And we're able to achieve a lot of those things using these youth exchanges. Um, any, any voyage that we run a youth exchange on comes into Dublin, generally during the, the Dublin Port River Festival. Uh, they have a budget for ship recruitment, but they tend to get very good value for their money because we're already bringing the ship into the area and if we can get, come up with some extra four or five thousand euro for the ship, well that helps pay for the ship and it keeps our, our funders happy. Um, <clears throat> they're also, they have provided us a really good structure for designing a good educational programme so that our voyages we would hope are, are starting to get to the stage where they will be of a good quality. Um, you're setting educational aims and objectives, you're training leaders that will implement them and you're, um, you're achieving them. So it, it does provide a good structure. Um, they also, in Ireland, of course, we have uh, Northern Ireland and, and the Republic, uh, which are, uh, we, 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 can, we can run a youth exchange on the island of Ireland, essentially. Um, so we have a partner in Northern Ireland, which uh, in, in the UK and in the Republic, so we can bring groups together and, and it provides a platform for that cross-border work, which is um, you know, uh, an important part of, of social development in Ireland. <coughs> um, yeah, and we do involve a number of other port festivals as well uh, around Ireland, so we visit them and we try and uh, get an extra bit of a budget like that. Uh, so in summary, as John said, there's almost 15 billion over the next seven years. It's spread across the, all of the EU members, but um, there's potential for a lot more projects in the EU, uh, a lot more partnerships, um, and therefore a lot more voyages, increased number of funded trainees, increased support for the ships and festival, um, and increased educational values from our programmes. So uh, I'll hand you over to Monique at that. Thanks. We've got one more question beforehand, Michael. Sure. Um, we saw something about the, the deadlines for the projects earlier. Mm. W uh, when do you typically get the go-ahead and know that you have a, the uh, project approved? And I how does that fit in with the planning timetable for the ship? Yeah, it's, it's a challenge. Um, we, did the <laughs> uh, we did the application this year in October, and I'll know by the first week in December. Um, obviously, the ships are trying to set their programs in advance of that. So, and, and we can't make a, a commitment to a ship until we have the grant approved. So it's a case of keeping an open line of communication. If, if uh, a, a ship hasn't got guaranteed business, well then they, they can't guarantee me that they're going to be there. So that's so, where it is. So that contradicts the slide I showed you, which comes from a central website, which shows applications, if I remember correctly, in March for, for the period f from June. You can actually make them much earlier at least yeah, in Ireland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's something which, which you need to check up on. Yeah. A question there too. Is it possible to identify ships who, in the particular 10 days concerned, w would normally be empty, so who are not taking much of a risk? I'm thinking, for example, of ships who will be joining a tall ships race and have no one f on mm. a leg to get there. Yeah, it's... Um for instance, next year, the tall ships are coming to Belfast, so there's a lot of ships going to be in that general area. So we'll have a lot of options. Um, but yeah, um, we, we do focus on the, the, like, not on the tall ship races. Monique does a lot of youth exchanges during the tall ship races. So our focus is in, in the IRC to keep ships busy when they wouldn't necessarily be normally busy. Okay, thank you very much, Michael. Thanks. Thank you. Well, thank you, John. Um, well, I, it's nice to see that some of our partners are actually here, and uh, some of the ship operators that we work with are here. And it's, um, I think it's good that, that we give this overview, because it has been a sort of a box, like how do you do it and how does it work? And it's, um, it's not a secret or something like that, but it has been unclear for a lot of people what the uh, uh, parameters are to run a project like this. Um, and as John said, there is so many rules and regulations within the EU that you have to tread very carefully. And during my presentation, I will go over how we do it 
and how we've structured it in such a way that we can operate more programs and have more young people benefit from the opportunity that the funding is available. Um, we started in 2004 with our first project. Um, since then we've done 26 uh, exchanges um, and quite a number of nationalities, uh, 17, so we're not yet there on the 27 that would potentially be able to join, but it's also about building the partnerships, which is uh, it's a time-consuming uh, process because you have to trust each other, which I will come back later. Um, well, 16 ships and uh, over a thousand participants. Um, we first build up experience the first two, three years with just one project a year. So um, applying in, in different countries, working with different partners, and then we felt we had the structure in the back office to do the paperwork and all the administration that is uh, needed. So from uh, 2008 onwards, we started doing more projects each year. Uh, and we um, uh, would like to we do six now a year, and we like to go up to, uh, to maybe 10. So basically this process is also an invitation for others to come to us and say, hey, we want to participate either as a partner or as a ship operator. Um, the, the funny thing with the EU funding is, as, uh, as John explained, is that it is spread to the national agencies um, and that, um, that, that makes the problem. In general, for all the countries, and the benefits are that um, you reduce the voyage fee, which is um, helpful because of uh, the, the costs on, of operating the ships is high are, and are getting higher every year because of the new regulations. Um, and uh, that is also actually how I started it in, in 2004, because we just um, were obligated to, to get the ISM on board system, and it meant for most of the ships that they more or less needed an extra officer to be able to do all that paperwork. And um, then we said, okay, well, then, then I saw less youngsters coming in, and we wanted more youngsters going on board, because as ship operators, we were doing more and more events to make the cost instead of taking young kids out sailing, where I actually started um, my career with, because I like to go out with the youngsters. Um, the structure is we, as a, uh, at CISO Training, are not the one applying for the funding. The, we work on behalf of the NSTOs and yacht clubs or schools, youth organizations, uh, and we support them with the process of applying, because we have the knowledge. Most of the NSTOs are volunteer organizations and busy people with their normal regular jobs. Um, and, um, well, we outfitted now to do that paperwork. Um, the toll ships are as much a partner as the uh, NSTOs or youth organizations we work with are, because they take a part of the risk as well. And um, we are basically the coordinator. The reason why I specifically mentioned the toll ships being a partner is because of the deadlines we talked about. So um, all the programs are planned for next summer already. And if you um, take the October deadline, you hear in December whether or not you will have the funding. But that means for um, ship operators, it's already quite late to have confirmation on trainee numbers. And uh, we therefore start with trainee recruitment already now, and we share the risk. So we as a coordinator, if we don't get the funding, we have uh, some of our hours not covered. Uh, like you said, part of the budget goes into the organization. The toll ship uh, takes a risk because if the trainees are already registered to go on the ship, but the funding in the end is not coming, then they miss one third of their income. The trainees take a risk because um, they will not get their travel costs to and from the ports funded. So everybody is a partner in, in organizing it, and we, sh we made the program and the structure in such a way that we share the risk. Um, the good thing is um, that what, what we actually started as uh, using the program to get sail training funded, um, and actually, it, it developed into something far more interesting, because we had the uh, the structure of the program helped us with with having good international exchanges on board. Before that, I had international exchanges, and then 
we as a crew did some other activities and it was nice and well sort of through sailing the ship together they would get to know each other but because of the the questions from the EU and the request in the application to have a dedicated program um, we were um, able to to improve the learning outcomes but also the friendships you really you really see that the the better the program is structured the more um, uh, bonding goes on and the it's really long-lasting friendships. We still have youngsters from the first year that uh, are no longer youngsters anymore, but that travel uh, to each other for uh, parties um, and uh, actually do celebrate birthdays still together. And with the low-cost airlines, that is lovely because you can hop on a flight and just go back to Cadiz to see your friends. So it's good to see that. Um, then the... the um, the other benefit still to do it is that uh, for besides the one third in reduction, the travel costs, because well, most of you work with, uh, with youngsters and disadvantaged youngsters, and then if you have the voyage funded, you still need to get the youngsters up to the starting point of a tall ship's race. And that adds actually to the budget which is needed for, uh, for a trainee. Um, it is a bit of a pity. We were not so very pleased. Uh, Erasmus Plus started this year. And before that, it was youth in action. And under the old rules and regulations, you would get 70% back of your travel cost, of the actual costs. And now they've made it a lump sum. So it is 70 euros or 170 euros, depending on the distance a person needs to travel to get to the starting point. And we already saw the, um, well, this was not a good result because Hungarian youngsters, for example, um, they need to travel quite far and quite difficult because there's, they have less opportunities with low-cost airlines and they have to make transfers. So for Dutch kids flying out of Amsterdam, there's a lot of opportunities. They could get flights for 100 euros to, to go to the start port. And then these Hungarian youngsters needed to pay 500 euros to get to the starting point. And in the old days, um, the Hungarians would have gotten much more funding for those travel costs than, uh, than nowadays. And um, that are the exceptional costs you were mentioning is a way you could, uh, could apply for extra funding for it, but it's really difficult. It's without out of the standard. So um, we are, we're very curious how new regulations will pop up, but we see. Um, as Michael explained, the uh, SEAL training as activity in itself is not fundable. Um, what it, the, the program is about working around a team and designing a program with activities that fit within that team. Um, and um, as, as Michael uh, touched also uh, earlier, is the, the more you implement the normal things that already happen on board, into the program and describe them in such a way that it has a learning outcome um, makes it possible to combine it with the SEAL training activities. The, the watches that trainees do with the, uh, for eight hours a day are just some of the activities they do. Um, Monique, can, I, can I just interrupt there? Because yeah. I think this is an important point to clarify. Yeah. So what you have on the slide is not my understanding. Because for me, sail training is about developing skills for young people. It's not about learning to sail. So it seems to me that sail training is fundable, provided that it's, that it's correctly organized with the program. Is that not right? Um, well, it, it, the, the, the structure works in such a way that you fill in the application, you attach your program, and then... Um, the first people to look at it are the people in the national agency. Mm -hmm. And the next step is that it goes to uh, individual, three uh, individual um, people that are trained to do selection processes. And they just um, look at your application if it fits with the rules and the mm -hmm. criteria. And the problem is that they don't understand SEAL training. Mm -hmm. So what we do to make sure that we lower the risk for the ship operators, the trainees, that the funding is not um, uh, granted, um, we go to the national agency and we explain what we do. And that's very important for all of you who haven't done this yet. Don't just apply cold, you have to educate yes. those who are taking yeah. the decisions first. Yeah. Um, and in the, um, on the Youth in Action, it was only 
um, the people in the agency would look at your application and then say, yes, it is for uh, fitting the criteria, and then it would go to the committee. Now there is a step in between with these three individual ones who are outside of the agencies. Most of them are volunteers. And they make an assessment and then they combine the three individual assessments and then it goes to the committee who says which project is getting the money or not. So they've made it one more uh, step complicated actually. Um, so far we've had all the new projects approved as well. So for us it still works. Um, but um, what we do um, in, in our projects and our teams are always around a maritime part and a cultural exchange part. So um, being on a night watch and having time uh, to sit together and to chat, we say, well, that's something they do anyhow. Um, and then we feed in a discussion about uh, a certain topic that the young people find interesting. With us, the youngsters write the program themselves. So every year it's different subjects or a different theme. But all the steps that you do and the, the things that are logically happening on board are feed it into the program as an activity which we need to describe with the methods we're going to use, the learning outcome for the youngsters and how they're going to organize it. And that's quite an extensive process. Um, on top of this whole thing, you have um, country-specific objectives. So it could be that within the EU, uh, the team or the, the um, uh, aim is to uh, improve employability of youngsters but that there is a national agency says on top of that we would like to do something more about uh, democratic values. And then you, if you don't put democratic values in your application, you will not get it. Because they've specifically explained with putting this aim that they would like projects around that team. And um, well, we've had years that we had to be very creative to fit within that team with our activities. Um, and then you also have to take into account that there is national regulations that in varies per country. I mean, in Ireland, you're not able to have boys and girls under 18 in the same hold. So if you would plan an exchange with that age group and you're not aware um, and you hire a ship that has a hold, you might end up in not being able to run the program. And... Um, Finding out those rules and regulations is a part of what we do. And it's not, it's not easy because at the start you don't know where to start looking. Because you, from another country, you have no idea what is normal in that other country. And that's also a very important um, part. And that is also why we go to each national agency and to make an appointment there to talk about our projects so that they can explain to us what the extra rules are. Um, <coughs> now, we've said already a couple of times, the communication with the agencies is really, really important. Um, what the EU wants is that it's not us as organizations that do the applications, but that the youngsters learn from the whole process of the youth exchange. So from the moment you start with thinking about a project, youngsters should be involved in the route um, uh, the content of the program, the team, the whole application. And we've developed a model where old trainees and participants in exchanges grow to be first uh, a mentor and then a leading mentor. So they, they, the, the learning process continues after the exchange and before the exchange and over several years. And that is something the EU really values and that you can also show back into your applications that it is not a one-off, but it is a continuous process of educating young people. Um, and the important part, what also Michael talked about, is that you need the youth leaders, and we call them mentors on board, uh, because it makes the distinction with the watch leader who is part of the professional crew, and then we have our mentors, so that's clear for the participants who to go to when they have questions. Um, there's quite some challenges in the planning because uh, ship operators are uh, willing to take a risk but the risk should not be too big and that means that we need to plan um, where the ships are going and want to be and which parts of a tall ships race they need support for with uh, respect to their own trainees that they normally could book themselves 
Um, it needs to be very strategic because um, with the uh, multinational exchanges, so if you do more than uh, two countries, it is also nice if you visit more than two countries uh, because then it sticks in the program that you do a multicultural exchange. But then you need to make the schedule in such a way that you are able to visit three countries. And um, what we also see is that the... Um, um, the EU budget is transferred to the countries according to the number of youngsters they have in their country. So, for example, Finland is um, in, um, in meters a quite a big country, but in the number of youngsters it's smaller. And they also get a smaller part of the budget, and that means that um, you are less likely to have your application uh, granted. And... Um, there again is the contact with the agency very important to already prior know how much applications they normally get, uh, what their interest is, what their new uh, aims are for that year so that you can really fit in and make the chance that you get it as big as possible. What we also um, do is because we want to involve, we give the opportunity to a lot of NSTOs to send their youngsters to an EU exchange. So we also plan with all the NSTOs, when, when is your holiday season and how many youngsters would you like to send and what are, what are their interests and where would they like to go? And uh, the good thing with having more exchanges now is that um, they are throughout the whole summer season, so any NSTO that would like to fit in can fit it in within their uh, uh, summer period because we're still bound to summer periods. Um, the other thing to take into account is, for example, in... Um, oh. yeah. Okay. yeah, it's back again. Um, for um, the, the projects we do and the amount of work that is involved, um, doing it for less than 36 youngsters is almost impossible because then the, the costs of doing the whole application and the administration is too high. Um, what we also see is that for the content of the program and to really have good learning outcomes, a project around 12 to 14 days is key. And we also see that we've done projects up to thir till 18 days, and that was actually a bit too long because they're so close together and the project is really full with all the activities and the extra activities. So we saw that 18 days was too long, so we finally came in the end to the 14 days. And... Um, what we see that works best is um, a mix, five to eight countries and nationalities together. That is a real good mix, <coughs> because then it's really interesting on board. And then you do, do not have the benefit of one of the countries um, being better in Eng English and then having for some of the participants to have difficulties. <laughs> and if you make take five or six countries, then everybody has to make an effort to communicate. So it's also better for the content of the program. Um, well, then you have the financial challenges, um, because as I said, it is only one third of the budget, <coughs> and the EU requests you to include disadvantaged youngsters. In Ireland, um, it's not even allowed to ask a, uh, a fee from the youngsters, but uh, in other countries, luckily it is, because it makes it easier for us, because otherwise we had to find additional funding for the full board price uh, for all the youngsters. And now we can use uh, multiple sources to support youngsters that are disadvantaged and are really not able to find any additional funding themselves. And basically it's a one-off with each project to see where we can get money for which nationalities. <coughs> um, if you're interested, come to me and then I'll check with your country what opportunities are because it's the variation with 16 nationalities is just too big to present it here. Um, um, well, we've talked about all the challenges and uh, the way we structured it, we found a solution in that we, um, uh, we are now able to do the coordination with the ships. We by now know and ships know how it works, so that, that really works well. And uh, because we coordinate it, we also use um, six agencies now to do an annual application. That means that we are able to up the numbers of youngsters and ships that we can support uh, with the funding. Uh, but it also makes sure that we are not applying with three similar projects in the same country. Because then with the late deadlines, 
and uh, you're bound that then two ships or two projects will not get uh, their grants and that is then only three months before the voyage is planned and that's not nice. So we strategically work with all the NSTOs to make sure that we have one application per country per year um, and that we, with the good contacts with the agencies, get them granted. Um, this, the, and the rest of the sheet was already explained. Um, what we are actually proud of, and that was the first time it was a bit uh, exciting because then they were calling us and uh, with a day note and said, okay, we're going to do an on-site uh, on uh, assessment. So the mentors got slightly nervous, like, oh, they're coming to check us now. And actually it, um, it turned out to be uh, a, a very good benefit for us and a good promotion. Uh, we've had, had two assessments now and both assessors have said that they've never seen such a good project running uh, on the other assessments that they did. And I think that a big part of, yeah, I think that a big part of the success is the fact that we do use the, the toll ships that are structured and that we do have this confined environment where we can really make good programs. And we always say it is funding still training, but the program itself is still training plus because it's much more than just still training because of the extra activities. Um, and another good thing that we see is um, that most of the youngsters that have participated are coming back and staying involved with SEAL training. We now actually have a lot of um, uh, volunteer crew members, but also paid crew members that changed their careers and stayed into SEAL training. And if I look at the youth council, there's a lot of the youngsters that have participated in our programs and they, they stay. And uh, we even have directors. Uh, of ships that have come from SEAL training uh, 10 years ago. So uh, that's also something to be proud of, I think. Um, I, I would like to, uh, to open for questions, of course, but um, specifically make an open invitation for everybody in the room interested in joining up in the programs to contact us and uh, be part of it. And also for smaller ships, we have done projects with more smaller ships together so that you come to the right number of uh, participants. Um, it's even more careful planning that you have enough contact moments, but it is possible. So if you're interested, please come to us. But Monique, that means that there's a difference in, in your experience from Michael's. When Michael said, I think that all the participants in the project need to be together all the time, whereas clearly in your case, that's not the case. No. No, but so this, that depends on the national agency it you're talking to. Depends on the national to. agency again. So yeah. again, we have this is the main lesson we need to give you. You must talk to your national agencies. They're the ones who are going to be interpreting these rules, and there are wide variations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Monique.